Today, when I am supposed to uh, talk to you about uh, how psychology emerged as a discipline, it reminds me of uh, you know, an experience that I had several years back. During my undergraduate days, when I was uh, going through the history of psychology, because it was uh, you know, uh, prescribed in the uh, course template at my, at, uh, my university. I found uh, the history of psychology to be very dull and dry. And uh, the primary reason I guess now is uh, that uh, uh, things were you know, told to me uh, in a very, very uh, what you call linear fashion, uh, where the different schools, uh, the major personalities and their contributions. You know, uh, it was taught to me and this is how you know even uh, several of uh, the textbooks of uh, history of psychology also talks about. Somehow I uh, found it extremely dull, very very dry, not at all uh, fascinating. Twenty years down the line, today when I read uh, the history of psychology and when I am in a position to uh, a larger extent to uh, relate things. Uh, the constructs, uh, the personalities, the time frame, okay, uh, the happenings that was taking place, uh, you know, in and around uh, the other areas. Now I find uh, the history of psychology to be very fascinating, and I also find it relevant. Something that I didn't find, uh, you know, 20 years back. Two important things that I understood was the first that uh, at any given time in the society, there are certain practical needs. And development that takes place in any discipline, okay, basically is an attempt to cater to those practical needs of the society. And so has happened even in the case of uh, psychology, where uh, attempt was made because there were social compulsions, because there was a need uh, for certain things at that given point in time and therefore, uh, things developed the way they developed. And second, that the strength and the limitations can be very well understood only when you view things in their historical context. The moment you uh, know dealing it from the context, okay, the strength and the limitation of something that has historically taken place, okay, it is very difficult to uh, visualize it. And therefore, now I find that uh, the history of psychology, when I am trying to uh, know in a very, very comprehensive way uh, share it with you, okay, I find it extremely relevant, I find it very fascinating. Traditionally, uh, what has happened is that uh, usually uh, the books, the university curriculum, they will talk about uh, the major schools. Okay. And then uh, you will have uh, the different uh, uh, stalwarts, who gave certain theories, who gave certain uh, know, propositions. Okay. They are taught. This could be one way of approaching uh, how psychology emerged as this discipline. The second approach could be, where you take the major influences. Okay. Uh, the way I have uh, you know, put it here, where you have the philosophical influences, the influence that was exerted by development in the area of uh, physiological sciences, and then how different schools of thought gradually started uh, evolving. And then finally, how contemporary development has taken place in the area of psychology. Now, when I do all this, uh, I will uh, know uh, deviate a bit after a couple of uh, minutes. What I will primarily do is that I will look at uh, know the two strong influences, the philosophical influences and the physiological influences. And then I would go to uh, the major schools and even within the major schools, I would only talk about uh, the major theories or the major ideas that was uh, know developed at that point in time. And especially uh, my uh, emphasis would be that how finally, even though we had initially begun with, uh, uh, no, uh, with the philosophical influence, how psychology gradually started emerging as a discipline, which uh, was more into 
you uh, know the scientific study of a behavior more into a very systematic study of a behavior and how uh, this discipline actually became uh, much more scientific in nature. So, first we begin with uh, the philosophical influences and uh, as you know I am just summarizing uh, know, uh, these major influences. René Descartes uh, was uh, the first person who you can uh, give the credit of influencing psychology and primarily he was talking about the mechanism uh, and the mind body problem. Uh, mechanistic uh, conception of the body was uh, another important uh, construct uh, that he influenced. The theory of reflex action was something that uh, uh, you, know, you can root it to René Descartes. Mind body interaction was another very, very strong and important construct uh, that actually came uh, uh, because of the influence of René Descartes. And two important things, one the localization of uh, mental functions in the brain and the doctrine of innate ideas. Okay. You would find uh, that uh, these six important developments uh, in the area of psychology can be traced back to René Descartes. Uh, Comte, John Locke and uh, George Berkeley. Okay. Uh, these three uh, important philosophers also influenced uh, psychology to a greater extent and uh, Comte can be given uh, the credit for uh, know, influencing the uh, concepts like positivism, materialism and empiricism and John Locke uh, you know, talked about the how mind acquires knowledge okay. and George Buckley gets the credit of talking about uh, mentalism. Then we have uh, you know, uh, the influences of David Hartley, James Mill and John Stuart Mill. Okay where uh, David Hartley was actually talking about reputation, it was John Mill who talked about uh, mind as a machine and John Stuart Mill actually talked about the mental chemistry. Okay. So, many of these things you find later on being discussed in the domain of psychology, which actually has its root uh, know, in the early philosophical influences. Another important influence that psychology had uh, was from uh, those who were working in the area of physiology and uh, important constructs like uh, reflex behavior was proposed by Marshall Hall. Hall also talked about something called extirpation which actually was uh, you know, uh, a process where you remove or you destroy a part of the brain of an animal and then you try to observe the behavioral changes that the animal has undergone. Okay. So, this was uh, know another uh, technique uh, which actually was uh, part of physiology, but later on you find that uh, psychology also was heavily influenced by this technique. Paul Broca everybody in psychology knows him okay, and he actually is given the credit of uh, evolving this uh, clinical method, where uh, know posthumously examination of the brain structure was done and he would uh, primarily try to correlate uh, the changes that has uh, taken place in the brain okay. and uh, accordingly he would correlate it with uh, the behavior that the individual was showing. Okay. So, basically uh, post survival stage, post death of an individual, okay, you just uh, know examine the brain and you correlate uh, the brain with the behavior. Uh, this was no little different from uh, the method that uh, was uh, know, uh, given by uh, Marshall Hall. Uh, where he was trying to destroy or remove part of the animal's brain okay, and then trying to see the changes that the animal has undergone. By 1870 an interesting method came forward okay. till now uh, the methods were uh, either uh, extirpation or the clinical method, but then uh, Fritsch and Hitzig they came forward with a method of electrical stimulation where weak electric currents were uh, know, introduced to the cerebral cortex and then uh, the motor behavior of the subject, the individual was observed. Okay. And you would find that extra, uh, electrical stimulation as a technique has been used you know, for very, very long in uh, the history of psychology. Another important person uh, was uh, Hermann uh, Helmholtz who not only influenced uh, psychology, but uh, primarily his uh, contribution was in the area of physics, in the area of physiology and by default you know he also influenced uh, development of 
psychology. Weber, uh, who actually gets uh, the credit of uh, two things, the concept of two point threshold and the concept of just notable difference. No? Uh, till date, uh, no, those who study uh, the psychology of perception, okay, in the perceptual process, people do refer to two point threshold and just noticeable difference and uh, undergraduate students must be doing practicals uh, on these constructs. Another important uh, uh, person uh, who influenced uh, psychology was Fechner. Fechner did talk about the uh, mind and the body. But most importantly, Fechner should be given the credit of uh, developing a technique whereby the mind body relationship can be quantified. I remember uh, earlier also know right from uh, philosophical days uh, itself, the relationship between mind and the body was always being studied. It was always uh, know a primary uh, area of interest for uh, behavioral scientists. But Fechner uh, no, should be given the credit, because he did talk about the mind and the body relationship, but then his idea was primarily to quantify this relationship. Okay. And till date, okay, uh, psychology is under the influence of quantification of human behavior. The concept of uh, absolute and difference threshold was also talked about uh, uh, by Fechner. And the three methods of uh, psychophysics that we uh, read nowadays the method of average error, the method of constant stimuli and the method of limits. Okay. Fechner is given the credit of developing one of the method and actually he systematized uh, you know, the remaining two methods and all these three methods are now established method that are a part of psychophysics. Gradually psychology you know after the influence of these uh, philosophers and uh, the people who were working in the area of physiology. Uh, psychology has started uh, gradually taking its shape and we all have heard about William Wundt, okay, who primarily talked about the study of conscious experience and to him conscious experience was both the mediate and the immediate experience. Okay. Method of introspection uh, was uh, given uh, major credit and uh, the whole of psychology started uh, you know, revolving around uh, this very method that William uh, Wundt uh, talked about. Okay. He did talk about the elements of conscious experiences and primarily uh, you know the whole concept of a perception, which is actually how you organize uh, you know uh, the elements uh, in your uh, mind. That was uh, you know something that uh, Wundt talked about. Hermann Ebbinghaus, we all know him. Okay, he uh, gets the credit of uh, influencing the construct uh, of learning, where especially he talked about the nonsense syllables till date. Uh, you find the reference of uh, nonsense syllables uh, whenever you talk about learning, whenever you talk about memory, all experiments uh, know across board okay, uh, would ha invariably have uh, the usage of nonsense syllables. Brands Brentano was uh, another important uh, person who did talk about the study of uh, the mental acts. And uh, Stumpf came forward with uh, phenomenology, which was actually uh, no introspective method, which was examining the experience as it occurred, uh, rather than reducing it to uh, elementary components. No, and Stump's uh, no way of uh, looking at introspection as a method. Okay, uh, started uh, no making a deviation from what uh, Wundt had initially suggested. Okay, and then it was Kulpe who talked about the systematic uh, experimental introspection and where uh, introspective method was used to seek information about uh, um, an individual after the experimental task was complete. Okay. And then of course, Kulpe also gets the credit of talking about imageless thought. Uh, now, I am uh, know, uh, taking uh, the route that is usually followed uh, in most of the books of uh, history of psychology and uh, most of the universities. Uh, course structure follows this template, where you talk about different schools. Uh, but I must tell you that uh, my idea is uh, to uh, just summarize uh, the major individuals and their uh, contributions, the major constructs that was uh, talked about uh, know, under uh, the ambit of that very school of thought in psychology. 
but then once again I will uh, know make a deviation once I complete uh, know the neophradians thereafter and then I will uh, know gradually go into much more detail of how psychology started taking its uh, shape and becoming more and more systematic and scientific study of behavior. So, coming to uh, structuralism, okay, uh, Titchener uh, gave the concept of uh, the content of a conscious experience and he did uh, contribute a lot to it. And then uh, comes uh, functionalism, uh, where the primary emphasis was more on uh, the functional outcome. And once again, uh, you, know, you can uh, uh, trace it back to Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin actually uh, you know, did not uh, make a direct uh, uh, impact on uh, psychology at uh, his time, uh, but he had a very diverse interest. And if you can relate the present day development to uh, the contribution of Charles Darwin, you will find interesting uh, relationships. For example, comparative psychology is uh, one of the branches of psychology and uh, when you start uh, tracing the roots of uh, uh, this uh, domain of uh, knowledge, you can trace it back to Charles Darwin who had actually focused on uh, animal psychology. Okay. So, primarily uh, know the focus of uh, attention on animal psychology could be construed as uh, the uh, basis for comparative psychology. Another interesting thing was uh, that even though uh, consciousness was the focus of attention till that time, okay, Charles Darwin uh, know, suggested uh, that the focus deserves to be on the functions rather than on the structure of uh, consciousness. And two most interesting things, uh, one that Charles Darwin should be given the credit uh, know uh, of accepting methods used in uh, other areas as well as using data uh, know uh, which is of interest of uh, different domains of knowledge. So, today what we refer to as interdisciplinary, what we refer to as multidisciplinary, okay. it was Charles Darwin who should be given the credit uh, know who actually advocated for accepting uh, the method and the data from multiple sources. And most importantly, the construct of individual difference. The importance of measurement of individual difference okay, was something that can once again be traced back to Charles Darwin. So, that way you, know, you can have these uh, four important contributions of Charles Darwin, which is actually a part of uh, functionalism, if you want to trace it back. Sir Francis Galton, okay, another uh, interesting uh, individual who actually uh, know, talked about mental in inheritance okay. and he is known for his research you know, on mental inheritance and uh, talking all about it. But the most important thing that he actually contributed to was quantification. What uh, know, Francis Galton was repeatedly talking about was that there is a possibility of quantifying okay, whatever you observe in human behavior. Then, of course, William James who talked about the stream of consciousness, uh, for him consciousness was a continuous flowing process okay, and any attempt to reduce it to elements uh, would actually uh, destroy it. Okay. Uh, besides William James, you have a uh, no long list of uh, people in uh, uh, psychology who influenced uh, psychology in one way or the other. Uh, for example, you can take uh, Hall, D.V., Angel, Carr and of course, you know, uh, Woodworth. But the most important thing was the legacy of functionalism, okay, which actually was um, you know, more and more into making psychology a very, very application oriented discipline. Okay. Uh, one, the contribution of uh, Cattell, uh, who was actually into you know, psychological testing and little later you know, our entire uh, focus would be on uh, the testing movement, uh, how actually you know from uh, one piece of work, it actually went to the whole area of uh, interest. And second, the two important movements that took place, one the clinical psychology movement and two the industrial organizational psychology movement. And there you find a reference of uh, Leitner, Whitmer uh, and uh, Walter Scott okay, uh, in the two, two different uh, movements. And these were you know the major uh, contributions which made psychology more and more application oriented discipline. Besides that, uh, the whole set of uh, you know, gestalt psychologists, what they are called as, 
Vardaimar, Kafka, Kohler. Okay. Uh, they contributed a lot to understanding uh, the whole principles of uh, perceptual organization. But very interestingly, uh, when you uh, read the construct of development of insights, okay, uh, especially the study of apes, okay, there you find you know that uh, even the whole construct of uh, uh, acquisition of information, learning of information, okay, and how insight plays an important role in this. Okay, the credit uh, can again be uh, given to the gestalt psychologist. And of course, we know the importance uh, of uh, field theory, Kurt Levin gets the credit for it and uh, the study of motivation and all psychologists would know uh, the Zygarnik effect. Then we come to behaviorism, uh, where uh, the major uh, know, theories uh, came, Thorndike who came uh, forward with a new uh, instrument called the puzzle box, where he did his uh, experiment and this is how the method of trial and error came into picture. Okay. And two uh, important laws came into existence, the law of effect and the law of exercise. Okay. Ivan Pavlov, we all know him, okay, who gave the whole concept of uh, classical conditioning. Although Ivan Pavlov was working on some other problem, uh, but uh, the outcome that he got influence psychology uh, to the what you call uh, the strongest possible extent and we have uh, you know the whole construct of classical conditioning. Uh, Watson uh, and uh, influenced uh, you know psychology like anything. Uh, Tolman uh, who should also be given the credit of introducing the concept of intervening variable in psychology. Okay. Uh, till that time, you know, psychology was mostly looked at, you know, from the independent and the dependent clusters of uh, variables. It was Tolman who did introduce the concept of intervening variable, and then uh, Clark Hull uh, who did talk about the hypothetical deductive method. But once again, uh, B. F. Skinner who did come forward with a major uh, construct of operant conditioning, and besides, you know, the explaining the whole construct of uh, operant conditioning, Skinner also gets the credit of introducing the schedule of reinforcement, which uh, once again is a mega construct in uh, psychology, and uh, the concept of successive approximation, uh, which actually explains, uh, you know, uh, how complex behavior are acquired by human beings. Okay, so these were, uh, you know, the major uh, constructs the, that was actually. Uh, talked about during the era of uh, behaviorism. But once again, socio behaviorism uh, know, came into picture and especially you have two important uh, individuals who contributed in this area. Albert Bandura, who gets the credit for introducing the concept of vicarious reinforcement and also talking about self efficacy and uh, Julian Rotter, who did talk about locus of control. All uh, know, psychologists would certainly be you know reading the constructs given by them and uh, uh, many of uh, these concepts are still part of uh, not only the uh, understanding of this uh, subject, but also you find them being used in their practical classes. And comes psychoanalysis where Sigmund Freud suddenly you know uh, uh, took a different uh, turn, where he talked about the theories of the unconscious mind. He did uh, focus on the sexual basis of neurosis, uh, evolved dream analysis as a technique uh, and most importantly, he did talk about psychoanalysis both as a therapeutic technique and he also talked about psychoanalysis as a system of personality. And uh, later on came uh, Anna Freud, Klein, Carl Jung, Alfred Adler and Karen Hornay all of them who are uh, usually uh, called as neo freudians who did not uh, know uh, uh, challenge the major construct of psychoanalysis but did try to explain human behavior okay in a way which was uh, know uh, deviating from the usual way sigmund freud had explained so these were you know the uh, major uh, contributions uh, but then uh, by the time uh, know personality was uh, being explained Okay, uh, by psychoanalysis, okay, uh, there was another uh, parallel uh, development that took place where uh, no different personality theories started evolving, and there uh, emerged the whole uh, no humanistic psychology. 
and especially two individuals Abraham Maslow who gave the concept of self actualization and Carl Roger who took the, uh, who did talk about positive regard no? the unconditional uh, love of the mother for an infant. Okay. Uh, he talked about it and these two were important constructs. Gradually you know psychology started uh, taking a different turn and then came uh, an important uh, turn around in the history of psychology what I am referring to here as uh, contemporary development. When George Miller uh, you know, started his work, George Miller uh, by training was not a psychologist, no, he was into uh, language and uh, later on he did uh, contribute in a very big way talking about uh, psycholinguistics. And then it was uh, Nasser who did uh, know compare uh, the functions of uh, human beings with respect to uh, the metaphors used in computer. And this uh, was a major turn around where uh, there was a shift from the SOR pattern of understanding and explaining human behavior where one would talk about the stimulus organism response uh, to uh, when one started talking about input transformation and output. And this is how cognitive psychology came into existence. More and more uh, influence of uh, the physiological processes which made it uh, evolve as cognitive neuroscience. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, uh, later on in this uh, series, uh, there is a section on uh, uh, neuropsychology where you would have uh, you know, uh, two, three speakers talking on uh, different, different topics. And then uh, you know, uh, there was also this influence of uh, biology where it was not only uh, you know, studied as uh, psychobiology, but it was also investigated from a socio-biology point of view and more uh, and more importantly, the evolutionary psychology emerged out as uh, an interesting area where behavior was uh, you know, traced back uh, to the usual evolutionary biology uh, way of explanation. Okay. So, the traditional methods used in psychology, the scientific um, uh, method, uh, the scientific rigor of uh, the uh, making a prediction about a human behavior, but then also taking an evolutionary viewpoint. Having uh, know, uh, summarized the history of psychology uh, in nutshell, okay, I am now making an attempt to revisit the scientific psychology and as I told you uh, that I would now be making a very, very uh, surgical intervention into the history of psychology, where I would uh, try to uh, trace how psychology actually became more and more uh, scientific uh, know, as a domain of study. Now, for this uh, I am uh, selectively choosing uh, the whole uh, you know, history of psychological testing and you can consider that William Wohn, Francis Galton and uh, uh, James Cattell uh, can be considered as the founders of the modern psychological testing. But I must tell you uh, that if you start looking at the history of once again you know the uh, testing and assessment you would realize uh, that testing uh, can be traced back uh, know, to a very, very uh, old practice in China. Okay. So, uh, now onwards what I will do is that I will first begin with uh, know, um, a neighbor, our neighbor uh, China, uh, what actually was being practiced there and then we will uh, know move to different European countries where uh, different, different developments took place uh, coming to US where uh, psychology was taken forward to uh, its uh, modern format, uh, we will then uh, know swing between Europe and US and then once again we will return back to India and see how uh, know developments took place uh, within this country uh, and what impact it had uh, know uh, on uh, the overall development of psychology as a discipline. Now, psychological testing is little more than 100 year old, okay. but then even though it had a very timid beginning it has now become a big business. Okay. You have uh, different, different uh, testing houses, where you pay a large amount of money. There are uh, no series of uh, no assessment that are being performed by uh, different, different consultancy agencies, government agencies. Okay. So, this has taken uh, shape of a big business. Very interestingly, uh, certain cultural institutions have evolved around psychological testing and assessment. 
Okay. And I refer to uh, Medina and Neil, who estimates that uh, the usage of achievement and ability test in US is approximately 200 million per year. Okay. And this gives you, you know, uh, an idea to visualize the quantum of the size of uh, this uh, whole development that has taken place. Going back to history, Sir Francis Galton, uh, you, know, you can give him the credit of uh, developing the first uh, battery, uh, what was the assortment of sensory and motor measures. Okay. And later on, it was uh, Cattell uh, who should be given the credit of uh, uh, talking about mental tests and measurements. Having uh, said that, now let us uh, go back to China and there you realize that testing uh, can be dated back to 2200 BC. Okay. And uh, I refer to Lai here, who says that uh, every third year, the officials in China had uh, a compulsion to undergo test of fitness. The Han dynasty in China introduced a written test in five areas, civil law, military affairs, agriculture, revenue and geography. These were the five areas. And interestingly, you will find that by uh, 1370, a three tier examination pattern had evolved. The preliminary examination, where uh, all the, the first uh, 1 to 7 percent of those who used to pass the preliminary, uh, preliminary exams, uh, uh, they took up the district exams and 1 to 10 percent of those who qualified it, okay, they had to go to Peking to take up the final exam. So, right from 2200 BC, you find that uh, the society felt the need for uh, testing and assessment of human capability. Okay. And even though it was not hardcore, uh, no psychological in nature, but you do find uh, that there was uh, no uh, felt need uh, that I was referring to right in the beginning. Uh, that after 20 years, when I realized that actually there are certain contemporary need of the society. Okay, there are certain uh, no uh, practical needs of the society that demands uh, that. Uh, certain things should definitely evolve. And therefore, uh, no, you find that uh, no psychological testing um, uh, was being practiced in China in a different form of course. What is interesting to observe also is that although testing uh, no can be traced back to China 2200 BC, but the validation of this whole process was actually not into a picture. No, it also it always remained an issue at that time. Okay. And this whole uh, testing system was abolished by 1906. Another important development that took place was not in the area of psychology, but in our sister uh, discipline psychiatry. Okay. In Germany, uh, Grasse was a physician who actually thought of uh, know, uh, measuring uh, what you call uh, the loss of certain capability in the brain uh, injured patients. So, he developed an instrument for testing the brain injured patients. The whole idea was uh, to show words, symbols and pictures through a slot in a sheet of paper that moved slowly over the stimuli. Okay. So, one uh, sheet of paper which will have either words, it will have symbols, it will have pictures. Okay. And uh, then you have another uh, sheet put over it, which will have a slot uh, there, an open slot and you move the um, paper with the slot over the picture, you know, which has this word symbols and pictures. Okay. This is actually what you see in memory drum. So, this actually you know the uh, process adopted by Grasse okay, can be considered as a precursor of the memory drum. Okay. And you see here right now on your screen, you have the memory drum. Of course, now it is being phased out because of the contemporary development of uh, uh, computers, because you can uh, know, replace uh, know, presentation of the stimuli. Uh, but traditionally, I do not know in the modern times, how many people have seen memory drum. But I remember my own undergraduate days, okay, where memory drum was used as an instrument uh, in the psychology lab, uh, where uh, know, uh, you can see here uh, a rotor put there. This rotor actually you know, could be used to adjust the uh, speed of the movement of the drum and uh, this uh, sky blue plate that you see on the top uh, and a white opening there. You, know, you can open uh, the slits there, where you have the blinking arrow. 
beneath which uh, a drum was there which where we used to uh, know put a sheet of paper we used to paste it uh, with the stimuli. The stimuli could be again anything uh, largely it used to be words, it could be nonsense syllables, it could be symbols, it could be pictures. All you ensure is that uh, without error you are in a position to present the stimuli to your uh, human subject okay, uh, uh, after a certain temporal limit. So, you have uh, know, designed your experiment and you ensure that after every lapse of these many seconds okay, the stimulus would change and memory used to serve this purpose. Now, of course, with development of computer memory drum as an instrument has uh, lost probably its significance, but then it did play a very, very significant role. All I am trying to say is that it is not only uh, the concept that developed, it is also the need of the society. It is also the development of certain tools, the development of certain techniques that should be taken into account. When we talk of uh, how psychology emerged as a discipline. Another uh, German psychiatrist uh, Conrad Rieger, he developed a test battery for the brain damaged patients. Now, you uh, see an interesting thing, no? the first uh, test battery that we were uh, referring to. Okay, uh, was uh, traced back to Francis Galton. Okay. And after Francis Galton, uh, you realize that uh, it is basically uh, Grasse who thought of the brain damage patients and came forward not with a test battery, but with an instrument. Okay. And again it was uh, Conrad Rieger, who again thought of uh, no assessment of the brain damage patient, but this time it was not an instrument, it was a test battery. The limitation with this test battery was that for its administration you needed more than 100 hours, something that is impractical uh, in terms of usage. And although it did not receive much um, uh, acceptance, these two developments, the development of uh, memory drum as a tool and the development of the test battery did contribute to the standardization process. So, Today, when we talk about uh, as a standardized test in psychology, okay, you can again refer it back to these two significant development in the history of psychology. Now, assessment of brain damage patients and uh, psychiatric symptoms became possible because of uh, know these two things. Another interesting thing, okay, uh, we are still in Germany right now and we are looking at developments taking place in Germany. Experimental psychology thrived uh, know, in Europe and also in England. And William Wundt, okay, uh, he was actually trying to uh, measure mental process okay, through the help of uh, a thought meter. On your screen, what you see a uh, swinging pendulum hitting two bells on two sides was actually you know, what uh, William Wundt called as thought meter. Okay. And uh, remember, note that it was, this was 1862 when he was trying to do this. Okay. Thought meter was actually a calibrated pendulum with needles on both the sides, and while swinging, it always uh, know the needle used to strike the bells. Now the observer had a task to note the position of the pendulum when he heard the sound of the bell. Okay. Now, Wundt had adjusted the needles beforehand and therefore, knew the position of the pendulum. What actually uh, was being recorded was the difference between the actual and the observed position determined uh, know, through this experiment and actually this whole process actually determined the swiftness of thought of the observer. Okay. I uh, quote William Wundt uh, that for each person there must be certain speed of thinking which he can never exceed with his given mental constitution. Okay. Now, if you uh, know look at thought meter, if you look at this whole process, okay, it might look okay, as if it was a very, very preliminary type of uh, an investigation uh, of uh, how human beings perform, but remember uh, that uh, this very experiment served the understanding of uh, several processes, which was actually a cause of concern for scientists in those days. Okay. Uh, in the area of astronomy, 
there was a big debate going on because uh, people in the observatory would uh, keep you uh, know tracking the movement of stars and then you uh, know two different uh, people would report uh, change uh, by certain time and therefore when william wundt uh, you know experimented uh, using his thought meter with whatever uh, way it uh, influenced psychology it did serve the purpose of answering a question in astronomy okay now uh, another interesting thing was that this experimental approach also contributed to understanding of certain very vital psychological processes such as attention motivation self correction and of prime importance once again individual difference now all four of them are extremely important constructs in psychology till date and you can refer it back to an experiment done by william wundt in 1862 okay so uh, this is uh, an interesting uh, development uh, that took place let us uh, know now uh, go back from uh, germany to england uh, where uh, sir francis galton actually attempted to measure intellect by measuring reaction time okay and sensory discrimination okay so these two were his uh, important uh, constructs and his work actually helped understand individual uh, differences in a much better way i'm not going into the details of what actually he proposed but what i'm trying to tell here is that the fact that the difference between two individuals can be measured can be quantified okay is something uh, that uh, no you should give credit to sir francis galton very interestingly he established a psychometric lab in london uh, at the international health exhibition and again it was 1884 when he did so now uh, as you can see on your screen no there was a, a long uh, corridor with uh, tables uh, put there and uh, he had put different instruments there and those instruments were primarily supposed to measure physical characteristics as well as behavioral uh, tests were also put now physical characteristics uh, such as height weight uh, head length head width arm span uh, length of the lower arm and so forth was the physical characteristics the behavioral tests such as strength of hand squeeze lungs capacity visual acuity reaction time speed of blow and the highest audible tone that can be uh, received by the individual these were the behavioral tests uh, that he had uh, exhibited at that time interestingly 17000 people were tested you know uh, uh, during this exhibition okay and you will be surprised to know that 7500 records of those 75000 individuals are still available okay and uh, of course i uh, refer to the work of uh, johnson and his colleagues for this but most importantly once again as you can see that uh, blinking statement on your screen that dynamometer was uh, used to measure the strength of hand squeeze okay and even now to measure grip strength okay to measure the strength of uh, the hand the to measure the strength of the squeeze okay dynamometer is still used as a tool so something that was used long back at that time you find that that makes a sense uh, to psychologists till date this method of measuring uh, intelligence of course perished but it did clear that objective test can be devised okay so this was an interesting realization and that the scores that you draw out of uh, your uh, objective test can be used to draw inference remember that now when you talk of uh, uh, statistical uh, interpretation of your data you do talk about inferential statistics psychology has moved to the extent where attempts are always uh, being made uh, with respect to uh, the how much uh, uh, inference can be drawn from what you have observed now let's uh, now go to the us James Cattell uh, developed a series of tests okay and he coined a term called mental test in his uh, paper uh, mental tests and measurements what he actually was talking about was the fact that uh, the bodily and the mental energies they are inseparable you cannot separate them one two that a uh, physiological measure is also an index of the mental power of an individual okay and uh, 
the interest of uh, James Cattell included uh, strength of hand squeeze using once again dynamometer, rate of hand movement, two point threshold for touch. Uh, I am sure many undergraduate students uh, must have done practicals on uh, two point threshold. Degree of pressure that is needed to cause pain, weight difference, reaction time for sound, time for naming color, bisection of a 50 centimeter line, judgment of a 10 second of time and number of letter repeated on one hearing. Okay. So, these were his interests. Interestingly, James Cattell had uh, of course, a uh, good number of students, four of his students uh, know made significant contribution to the development of psychology as a discipline. Thorndike, who is uh, know famous for his learning theories, uh, Woodworth, who wrote this exemplary book on experimental psychology, E. K. Strong, who is given the credit of uh, developing the vocational interest blank and uh, uh, Whistler, uh, who actually uh, no, made uh, a correlational study between the mental test scores and the academic performance. So, actually uh, whether psychological tests serve the purpose that it, it is meant for, okay, it is something that he tested. Now, uh, Weissler in 1901, uh, he did find the absence of correlation between the mental test scores with the academic achievement. Now, experimentalists by that time uh, gradually started discarding the concept of reaction time and sensory discrimination as uh, measures of intelligence. Okay. And of course, Whistler also uh, know, gradually turned his interest towards anthropology, but 70 years later you find uh, that reaction time once again revived as a major construct. Today, 2013. Okay, with all these uh, modern uh, equipments that are being used in psychology laboratories, you still have reaction time as an important variable in your study. Okay. But once again, you can see that uh, this uh, measurement of reaction time okay, can uh, once again be traced back. We are once again come back to Europe. In the middle ages in Europe, uh, people with intellectual disabilities were occasionally diagnosed as witches and they were put to death by burning. Broomberg, uh, he has uh, know, referred to a book, okay, uh, Flagellum Salutis, where he uh, know, says that a prominent physician advocated beating as a treatment for certain types of psychological phenomena like melancholia, frenzy, paralysis, epilepsy and facial expression of feeble mindedness. So, you can understand to what uh, great extent feeble mindedness was uh, know, disregarded uh, by the contemporary society in Europe. But then two French physicians, Squirrel and Seguin, they revolutionized the thinking of uh, uh, people in the Europe about people who are suffer from mental retardation. Now, Squirrel uh, actually was the first to propose uh, a three tier classification system for those who are suffering from mental retardation and this classification was based on language skill. First, those who use short phrases, two those uh, who use only uh, monosyllables and of course, those uh, who can only cry, but they cannot speak. In the late 1800s, uh, Swigun was the one who uh, was instrumental in uh, promoting humanistic view towards uh, the individuals who suffered from mental retardation. And he was the one who also developed educational program for the mentally retarded. In 1838, he established an experimental class for them. Okay. So, you find that there was a big change you know, uh, in terms of uh, catering to the need of uh, people with mental retardation. Now, Blin and uh, uh, Dame in France, they came forward with a battery of assessment for mentally retarded okay. and uh, this had 20 areas uh, know, such as spoken language, knowledge for part of the body, obedience to simple commands, naming common objects or ability to read, write and do simple arithmetic. What you find is that there was uh, know, a big uh, debate taking place in contemporary Europe and then there was also a felt need by the society uh, that the set of people who suffer from certain type of uh, feeble mindedness 
or what was later on uh, termed as mental retardation also deserves the attention of the psychologist. Okay. So, the social background of this time desperately needed a psychological tool for identification of such children. In 1904, an interesting development took place. The Ministry of Public Instruction in Paris appointed a commission to formulate educational measures and Alfred Binet and his student Simon, uh, they were asked to help the Paris school system uh, to identify children who are unlikely to benefit from the ordinary instruction that is being imparted there. Okay. And this is how Binet came forward with his first test of intelligence in 1905. This is considered to be a major milestones uh, in modern psychology.